experiences this week they'd like to share. This uh, week on Monday I, I went to a place called Slovenia, which is um, the former Yugoslavia, baptised a really lovely boat there, and it's a lovely little overlooked little part of Europe. Um, waterfalls and trees and like forests and everything. Totally not touristed. A uh, very genuine guy and uh, yeah, a beautiful guy. And uh, yeah, so just shut in. What's happened in your lives? Anyone got any testimony they'd like to give? Something wonderful happened or something awful happened? Got didn't work in your life? Sure you did. Can I share something? You can, yes. Uh, my um, grandson, who's 11, he went out to to the local park and he got attacked. Oh, but he's okay. <laughs> he's um he ran the police straight away. He ran the police. And they tried to make him take cigarettes and he got away from it. So yeah, he's okay. Just got bandages as well. And then half an hour later, he might go back and have But he's uh, yeah, he's okay. Uh, should we pray for him? Yeah. What's his name? Cameron. Cameron. Definitely pray for him. Excuse me. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, so just keep it on me then, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, just keep it on me. Yeah. Just a photo of what should be on. Yeah. 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 Right, so we're going to pray for Cameron. And uh, I'd like to pray that we, uh, we all have meetings with somebody this week and we can help for the gospel. Um, any other prayer requests? All people that have been attacked and all that around the world. People have been attacked because it's all post-traumatic stress for everybody. Mm. Um, you might like to say that Cameron's okay, but it's pretty stressful. Mm. Pretty stressful to go through that experience. There was a, there was a bloke the yeah, other it really shook me during the week. There was a bloke who got attacked. And that really kind of shook me. I got really angry. But the guy who did it, he got caught. So I was quite glad with that. Yeah, but it kind of got me annoyed a bit because yeah, there was no need for that. I don't normally, if things like that, that normally shock me. Yeah, but that was especially with an elderly man. Yeah, the old man was like, well, let's face it, we do live in Croydon, which is the sort of centre of knife crime, isn't it? I think we've got the highest stats <coughs> in the UK for knife crime down here, so... Um, it's yeah. worse, it's the worst um, borough. I'm a street pastor, so we get a lot of... It's the worst borough yeah. in uh, London. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we'll pray about that. And uh, anything else you want to pray for? Yes, Dave. You can pray for my friend Nigel. He, he got stung with a wasp on his. You know, every people. For Nigel? Yeah, yeah. 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 might have a good the doctor, you see. Mm. I think we need to pray for Karen's tooth because she says she's in so much pain it is. What did you say it's more painful than giving birth? <laughs> so Just I'm roll on tomorrow and I've got dentist. Yeah. Okay. I'll take it out. Mm. No, it's no fun having tooth pain. Mm. Why not? Well, let's, uh, let's pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus and we bring before you our lives. And Father, we want to tell you that we simply love you and we love the Lord Jesus. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will guide each of us to everlasting life in your kingdom. Help us, Father, to keep our faith and to grow in our faith. And open our eyes to understand your word and the message of the Lord Jesus. And as we wait, Father, for his return, we bring before you all our stuff. We thank you for Brother Sasha getting baptised in Slovenia. We pray that you'd be with him. We pray, Father, that you would be with all of us in the individual struggles that we have, that we may be shy to share. 
We pray that you'll be with all those who have been attacked uh, or who are aware of what's going on around us here. We pray that you'll help us all in, in, the, in the stress that that gives us. We pray especially for Cameron, that you'll be with him, that that young man will overcome what happened to him and will grow actually spiritually through that. We pray for our dear Cameron with, with a tooth pain and we pray for Nigel. We pray that we might have meetings with people whom we might be able to, to lead to salvation. We all shy, Father, when it comes to witness. We pray that you'll give us strength and brave bravery, that we might be able to witness to people. And above all things, Father, we, we pray that the Lord Jesus will return soon and that we might be ready and waiting for him when he comes. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Right, well, we're going to go on uh, looking at the teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, and I want to just look at Matthew chapter 5, and I'm just going to read these few verses, there's so much in pretty with every word that Jesus says. Um, well, last week we had a uh, Welsh accent, seeing we're all boring, you know, South Londoners, what about an Aussie accent? I mean, Robin, would you like to read this in your best Aussie accent? understand my accent. <laughs> you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savour, with what shall it be salted? It becomes good for nothing but to be thrown out and trodden under the feet of men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the stand, and it shines for all that are in the house. Likewise, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Thanks, Robin. So, clap, clap, like, you know, she can't read, but you know, she's, the reading's improving. Yeah. So, you are the salt of the earth. Now, of course, we're, in te we're inclined to read that as saying, you ought to be the salt of, salt of the earth. You must be the salt of the earth. But he says you are the salt of the earth. And who is he talking to? This is right at the beginning of his ministry. He's talking to ordinary, secular, normal people who have come out to listen to him. And he says you are the salt of the earth. So potentially, potentially God has set up for each of us, for each of us, to have an influence upon other people. To be the salt for them, of people. Now, the thing is, if you eat food without salt, it's not nice, is it? It's boring. In other words, we are the ones who can give other people something so they get a life, so that there is some, uh, something tasty, as it were, in life. Now, you are the salt of the earth. I'll send you, have you, have you done the numbers? Yes. Yeah, add another please. Right, so then, salt, okay, is just a very common chemical, right? Is, is salt expensive? No, it isn't. You can buy it really cheap. And there's plenty of it, there's no shortage of it. And of course that's us. So what he's saying is you, who are just normal and nothing special, you can influence this world. And the idea is that we each as believers have got our circle of people. We've got our world around us. Could be family, relatives, people we live with, whatever. And we are to influence them. And that is one reason why we were called to be believers. It's like when Jesus called the disciples, he said, come after me and I will make you fishers of men. So one sort of aspect or dimension to our being called to be believers is that we might actually influence other people. So that means that you cannot be a secret Christian. You cannot simply tick a few boxes in your mind that yes, I believe, and yes, I am a Christian, not an atheist, not a, you know, something else, okay? We, we, 
actually are to be, in some sense, public about our faith. Because actually, people don't have any other access to Jesus apart from you and me. You know, let's face it, most people in this world are in darkness and are not believers, seriously, serious believers. But when they meet you and me, then we have an influence upon them. So, one thing that salt does is that it provokes thirst. If you start eating a packet of salt straight away, I want to drink. We are the salt of the earth. So you, therefore, provoke in other people their thirst, their interest, their sense of need. And unless they meet you, they're not going to get that. It's more like this thing of Mother Teresa that, that Jesus has no other face apart from yours. He has no other hands apart from yours. So when you're baptised, you're baptised into the body of Jesus. And that means that you are his body in that sense. So that when somebody meets you, they meet Jesus. Let's face it, most people in this world don't read their Bible, they don't really look for God. But when they meet you and me, that is when they meet Jesus. And you see that this is for all of us. You are the salt of the earth. The problems uh, with sort of Christianity as a religion is that it can easily become the thing that, you know, there's a priest, there's a pastor, and then there's the mass of the audience who just trip along the church now and again, and trip out again of the uh, done, done my religious thing. No, you see, we each, we each have meaning, and we each have value, and we're each set up where we are in life, so that we might have influence upon other people. That's God's intention. So, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savour, with what shall it be salted? With what shall the earth be salted? And I think he's saying there that if the salt doesn't work, it's useless. And how is the earth going to be salted? You could read that as meaning that, in a sense, God has no plan B. But what I mean is, now let's say that I live in, uh, in a flat and I, I know some people in my block of flats and I go to work and I know about five guys at work and I have um, a family and out of those people, maybe out there's 20 people in my life. And I think the idea might be that if I don't witness to them, then they will, not, they will not actually get a witness. You could say that, well, yeah, okay, Duncan, if you fail, well, Joe will do it. And if Joe fails, then Karen will do it. And if Karen fails, then, you know, Joe Blow will do it. It could be like that. It could be like that. Or it could be that God has kind of structured his purpose in such a way that if you don't make that witness, the people won't hear. That's how I understand, if the salt is no good, with what shall the earth be salted? It depends on you. And if you don't do it, then it's not going to happen. And you think, well, why would God structure it like that? You know, God can save people any which way he wants. He could sort of parachute down a New Testament, or a little parachute all the way from heaven, down to earth, down to some guy walking on the street. He doesn't do that. He chooses to work through us. And if we mess up, does he find another way? I mean, do what he wants, maybe. Um, but I think what this is saying is that God has sort of structured it so that actually in some cases, no. Why? So that each of us might realize how important we are and what a critically important role we play with God and in his purpose. So if the salt doesn't have influence on other people, then they're not going to get sorted. And this gives you a huge value, a sense of importance, a sense of having a role to play, a sense of meaning. Well, I said the other, the other week, you know, man's search for meaning. 
This is why people are in addiction problems. This is why people are, are depressed. Doesn't matter, you're rich, you're poor. You're smart, you're stupid. You're, you're pretty, you're, you're ugly. It doesn't make any difference. It truly really doesn't. Man's search for meaning. What on earth am I here for? Well, here you have your meaning. That you can be of importance to someone else. That you are significant. Now, the other thing with salt, it's a chemical, right? N-I-C-L. I know you're at church, not chemistry. Yes, sir. But I used to be a school teacher. So, just a little bit of chemistry lesson for you. Salt is an inert chemical. Now, what's an inert chemical? An inert chemical is one that does, it is not influenced by any, anything else, by any other chemical that it mixes with. For example, if you've got a couple of chemicals, you put them together, oh, they bubble together. Oh, that caused an explosion. An inert chemical is not influenced by whatever you mix it with. It just stays as it is. Right? That's what an inert chemical is. And salt is like that. You put salt with, say, food or whatever, yes, it will influence its taste. But the salt is not changed by any other chemical that gets onto it. And that's how we've got to be. That we are in this world and we are not influenced by whatever we meet with. You, know? you, you, you can go preach the gospel uh, to a bunch of drug dealers, to, to, to uh, you know, a nightclub or whatever, and you're not going to start doing drugs. You're not influenced by those guys. You're safe because you are secure in who you are. Right? And so that is a characteristic of salt. So then, we are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savour, the watch will be salted, it becomes good for nothing but to be thrown out and trodden under the foot of men. Well, the idea is that you are of no use unless you are an influence on people. So that's a negative side, but the positive side is that you are something, that you have more influence on people than you imagine. You may think, but who am I? I'm just some obscure guy. I'm some obscure girl. Oh, no, no. You have more influence than you imagine. Absolutely more influence than you imagine on others. We have more meaning than we imagine. So, what's the next step? <laughs> you are the light of the world. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. But here he says, you are the light of the world. You get it? I'm the light of the world, you're the light of the world. In other words, whatever is true of Jesus becomes true of you. And you can actually read uh, a lot of that, uh, when you read the Gospels, you, you read Jesus saying, I am such and such, and then you read him saying, you are such and such. Here's an example. I am the light of the world, you are the light of the world. And that is what it means to be in Christ. Now I keep saying, come on guys, get baptised into Christ. When you go under the water, that's like death with Jesus. When you come up out of the water, it is like resurrection with Jesus. You are in Christ. And that's a big theme in all Paul's writings. You are in Christ. What he means is that God looks at you as if you are Jesus. You know, that is again the answer to man's problem with loneliness. But I am just lost in this world alone. There you have some identity. There you have some connection with something bigger than yourself. The Lord Jesus. And you know, people get involved in this, that, or the other, and then well, they get disillusioned with it, and oh, I thought this guy was the answer. Oh, no, he's got feet of clay. Oh, I thought this philosophy was the answer. I thought that was the answer. Oh, no, it isn't, you know? It's all got feet of clay. Hello, Becky. I can see you, Becky. So the point is, that Jesus is the one who will not disappoint. I bet there's a couple of chairs down here. Okay, so I'll get my drink before down there. You get a drink? Yeah, there's a chair down there. Thank you, down there. Thank you, So, you see, the point is that we are in Christ when you're baptised into 
into Jesus. Right? And all that is true of him becomes true of you. Well, Paul talks a lot about this in the letter to the Romans. And he gets up pretty deep, so he won't go too deep. But it's um, great stuff. He talks about the problem of sin and human weakness. That we sin, and the wage of sin is death. What can I do? Well, even if you say, all right, from now on I'm not going to sin. You're going to make it? You're going to not sin? <laughs> Look at it, Karen. <laughs> Why me? <laughs> Why so I've spoken again, that's why. <laughs> so, so, even if we say, right, I'm not going to sin again. Well, come on, get real, guys. You are going to sin again. That's something, you know, get real. So what are we going to do? Even if you have got so much iron in your soul, so much steel in your will, that you say, right, I'm not going to sin again, and I won't sin again. All right, and you don't sin again. Good for you. But the problem is, my friend, you've already sinned. And just one sin brings death. Look at Adam and Eve. They took one bite of the forbidden fruit, and they died. That's it. Right? You've already sinned, so already, you've got to die. Even if now, from now on, I'm perfect. Even if from now on, I've got that steel in my will and my soul that stops me from sinning. Yeah, big deal. I've already sinned, I've got to die. So, Paul says, well, what's the answer? And he says, the answer is being in Christ. And he develops his idea that when you get baptised into Christ, you are looked at as if you are him. Now, Jesus never sinned. He was our representative, but he never sinned. So, you are in Christ, and God looks at you as if you are Jesus. The issue about whether you sinned, whether you're going to sin, and all this stuff, that's all over there. The point is, you are in Christ. And he looks at you as if you are perfect. He looks at you as if you are Jesus. What he calls justification by faith. Justification means to be counted righteous. That is the good news of Jesus Christ. That we are justified by being in him. We are counted righteous by being in him. And actually when you think about it, that is... What happens if you love somebody? If you love somebody, really love them, you think that they're wonderful. In a sense, you see their weakness, but you see the weakness, but you think they're wonderful. So many times I've had a sister, a woman, say to me, oh, I'm going to marry whatever his name is, Tony or something. And I say that, <clears throat> you know Tony's a nice bloke, but he's a chronic alcoholic. You realise that, don't you? Ah, oh, yes, 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 I know he's not bloke. He's a lovely bloke. I said, no, I don't doubt he's a lovely bloke, but um, you realize what it's like being married to an alcoholic? You're going to get beat up a bit. There's always going to be problems with money, there be problems with hmm, all sorts of things. Oh, but he's a lovely bloke. Well, he's gorgeous. Well, I don't doubt he's lovely, I don't doubt he's gorgeous, but he's an alcoholic too. Like yes, yes, I know what I'm doing. Love is not blind, actually. She knows he's an alcoholic. And she she knows that he, he, he does he does knock me about, he does beat me up a bit, but not too much. It's a bit like you're in a, you're in this place, right? You don't ever think about it yet, but it's a crack in a wall. Yeah. You choose to ignore the crack. Right. Because because you don't want to believe it yet, so it's right. so sucked in with all the best. That's what I'm Yeah, that's it, that's a good one. And so that is how it is with love. Love is not totally blind. She sees he's an alcoholic and she knows he knocks her about a bit like not, not too hard. Just. Okay. Um, but you see, this is love. That is actually what love does. That is the process of in loveness. That you see the beloved as if they are perfect. I mean, parents and grandparents are running about putting pictures on the internet of all oh, my newborn grandson, all oh, my, my newborn granddaughter, isn't she beautiful? I children. Newborn babies are not very nice. Newborn babies don't look very beautiful. But they do look gorgeous to the 
parents and to the grandparents, oh, look at my intelligent, beautiful, good-looking, handsome, you know, two, two day old baby. Well, your eyes may be. But, um, and that's how I feel about my children. I still do. Um, what I'm saying is, I wasn't, wasn't talking to you, Karen, I talked about you. <laughs> I mean, I think you're wonderful, but you know, I think you're funny. Right, but this is what I'm saying. But God looks at us, not blindly. God is not a fool. God, God sees and knows all things more than we do. He knows what you're like. But he thinks you're wonderful. Really genuinely. Because that's what love does. That's another take of what Paul says about justification by faith. What it means is, God will look at you as if you are righteous, even though you are not. And he will count you as if you are righteous. Sorry, That's all right, all right. Uh, there's two chairs here, there's two there. Oh, there's two there. Sorry, sorry for interrupting. That's all right, I'm just happy to see you. There's a bar stool. And there's a, a right. So, to be in Christ means that God counts you as if you are righteous. Right? And that this is what Jesus is getting at when he says, I am the light of the world, you are the light of the world. Whatever's true of me is true of you. So, it's no good looking at this issue of sin and thinking, well, by the steel in my will, I will stop myself sinning. And I shall be pious for the rest of my life. Don't get rid of it. Don't get That's not how it is. There's no how it's going to be. But if you are baptized into Jesus, if you are in Christ, then this is how God will see you. That's why you are the light of the world, and Jesus has said, and I am the light of the world. We are him to this world. And it also follows that this world is in darkness. Can you imagine if there was no light in the world? There was no electricity, if there was no street lights, if there was no sunshine, and everyone's stumbling about in the darkness. Well, some bloke's got a torch. Ooh, come over here, show me. You see, that's how it is spiritually. This world is in total pitch black darkness, and we are the guy who's got the torch. We are the light of the world. And when you have light, then you see beauty, you see life differently. You, you can see dimension. You can see something. And getting back to this thing about we, that the world needs us. The world needs you. You are the one who has the possibility to give other people light. Yeah? As I said, it doesn't matter. If someone is rich, someone is poor, someone is pretty, not so pretty, someone is fat, thin, healthy, unhealthy, smart, stupid, all right, they're all struggling with this darkness and this total blackness. And actually they're stumbling around. But you can give them eyes so that they see, wow, there is a beauty in this world. There is this, there is that. You can do it. People stuck in depression, people stuck in addiction, you can be the light of their world. Now, don't forget, Jesus is up a mountain in Palestine in the first century, and he's got a big audience of ordinary secular people who sort of believe, but not too much, but do believe. And he says, you are, not you ought to be, or you shall be the light of the world. He says, you are the light of the world. So he's saying, be how you put what's potentially possible for you. For all of us here, we're all believers, one sort or another. We are the light of the world. We can radically impact somebody. Just imagine someone's been blind from birth, and you, abracadabra, give them their sight back. They're going to be, oh, thank you. Wow, colour. I never saw colour. Oh, what's that colour? That's red. Oh, what's that one? That's green. Yeah. But you are the one who has done that for them. And they are going to be so eternally grateful to you. Now, that is spiritually what we can do for people. You can open somebody's eyes to a totally new world. 
it is as radical as someone who can't see and suddenly they can see. Someone who has never experienced light but has stumbled around in darkness, groping their way in confusion. And you show them the light. Now, I said that you've got to imagine Jesus at the top of the mountain with a bunch of first century Palestinian peasants, basically, listening to it. And he says, you're the light of the world. They were Jews. And the light of the world was a phrase used in Judaism about the high priest. And in synagogues today, in this country and all over the world, wherever there's Judaism, they have a chief rabbi. And the chief rabbi is called a sort of thing in, in Hebrew, but it means the light of the world. The bishop, if you like, or they don't know bishops in synagogues, but the chief rabbi. He is the, uh, he's called the light of the world. And Jesus says to this bunch of Palestinian peasants, you are the light of the world. It's like, okay, we live in the UK, we have the Church of England, there is the Archbishop. <coughs> if I said, you are the Archbishop, Gemma. Karen, you're the Archbishop. Kev, you're the Archbishop. You'd be like, oh, get out. I'm just, I'm just an ordinary little person. See, that's how radical it was, what he's saying. When he says, you're the light of the world. Now, we don't pick that up necessarily uh, from this distance of culture and 2,000 years down the track. But there they were. A bunch of first century Palestinian peasants are all the rabbi and the, um, the high priest is the light of the world. And he says, you are the light of the world. So, he does this often. He say, you who think you are no good, you who think you are just, just one of the masses, you have got meaning insofar as you can radically impact somebody else's life. Right. And so, this is the same with us. You imagine, this is a totally off the top of my head fic fictional thing. You imagine a woman smoking a cigarette out of a flat window in, I don't know, somewhere, Penge, Crystal Palace or something like that. And she looks back at her life that evening as she looks out the window and she thinks, yeah. So abortions, three kids by three different blokes, not much of a career. I look in the mirror these days and I think, well, girl, you know, you're losing it, huh? <laughs> Don't have many friends. Never knew my dad, my mum just died last year. God. Well, I believe in God and I believe in Jesus. I'm sure, I don't read the Bible as much as I should do, but I do believe, absolutely, and I will stand up for Jesus. But I'm, I'm not perfect at all. Right? Poor, poor woman, poor us, poor people, they think, who am I? Nothing. Go to church, hundreds of people in the church, and they're like, oh yeah, I'll put a bit of money in the collection and all that stuff, and fly and hope for the best. Look, I'm, Jesus is saying, you are the light of the world, my dear. You are, you have got huge potential. You have got huge significance. You can actually influence people. That's why we start off with our prayers this, uh, today. I pray that this week we will, each of us, each of us, have meetings with people who we can share the gospel with. We'll shine. Me? Oh, no. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. You are something, and you can be something. I mean, let's face it, if you bring one person, let's say, to get baptized in Jesus, you've opened the world for that person. They can see. You've given them sight. They can look at the world through different eyes. They're going to be eternally grateful to you. Imagine living forever and ever and ever and ever, like a long line with no end. They're going to be, oh, Pam, or whatever your name is, Johnny, oh, thanks so much that you opened my eyes to it. Oh, thanks, and how can I thank you enough? Literally, they're going to be eternally grateful to you. And that is where you get meaning from. That is where you get meaning from. And as you get older in this life, you look back and you think of all the people that you helped, and you, yeah, you, you, you're not going to get depressed. You're not going to slip into addiction. Life is worth it, even if I die right now. How do I feel? Even if I get scribbled right now. Okay, so I get scribbled. Okay, but I've got 
are my regrets. No regrets. Because I hope they can come with Jesus. But you can do the same. You can do the same. And that is actually what you were called for. Because you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a lamp and put it under a basket but on the stand and it shines for all that are in the house. So actually if you are a genuine Christian, you cannot hide it. It comes out. But you see, what's different in, I'm afraid a lot of people's view, is I can be a secret Christian. I can in my own mind tick a few boxes and say, yeah, I'm a Christian. Um, I'll possibly sneak along to church now and again. I no. don't tell anybody. No. You're a city set on a hill and you can't be hit. Now, as you know, I've had quite a lot to do with the underground church in, um, in Iran, particularly, and more recently in Afghanistan, where there is the death penalty for changing from Islam to Christianity. So I baptise people online, which I may not think that's okay, but that's what I do. I get on Zoom and we pray and they put themselves in the water. Or many years ago, when I was preaching the Soviet Union, USSR, likewise there'd be problems with becoming a Christian. And with all those people, I used to say, look, just keep it quiet, right? If you open your mouth, particularly in Afghanistan, if you open your mouth and tell everybody, I'm a Christian, I got baptised, you are going to suffer and possibly you know, get beheaded. And I say to people, just keep it quiet. For your own sake, just keep it quiet. I won't put it on the internet, uh, no pictures, no nothing, just between you and me and Jesus, just keep it quiet. You don't want to get in trouble. And time and again I find that those people do get into trouble <coughs> because it slips out. Because a city set on a hill cannot be hid. People notice a change. What happened to you? They pick it up. And so those people do get persecuted because it does come out. So I'm saying that you can't be a secret, <coughs> a secret believer. You've got to come out. Now, you might remember the old Sally Army hymn, you know, Stand up, stand up for Jesus, and the soldiers of the cross. Well, 21st century Croydon, it, come out, come out for Jesus. You know, that's a, that, that's a language we use now, isn't it? You come out, people, come out. By the way, guys, you think I'm such and such. <clears throat> Actually, I'm this. You know? What about Celtic and Rangers? You're talking about, uh, that's a religion as well. And there was a player switched from Rangers to Celtic and you got... Yeah, well, whatever. But what I'm saying is, yeah, but come out, saying. come out for Jesus. They're these Celtic Rangers. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you say that. You, you, you dismiss it. You say that, that it is a religion. Oh, Celtic. it is. Oh, you're right. It's an idol. It's an idol. Yeah, it's an idol. But my, it's like Crystal Palace Football Club is, a, is an idol. It's a god to some people. Anyway. That's all right. What I'm saying is that come out, stand up, you know? You think, by the way, you guys think that I'm just one of you, just a secular sort of bloke. You know what, guys, here I am. But, you know what? I believe in Jesus Christ. It's not a case of what church you go to, it's not a case of being religious and pious, it's coming out for him. That's what it's about. So, you're the city set on a hill that cannot be hid. And he says, men don't light a lamp. Actually, it's got the article there, the lamp. And this is the translation of the light of the grid. And the lamp, it should be the candlestick. Men don't light the candlestick and put a bucket on top of it. Because the light is going to go out, right? And so I think what he's saying is... If you do hide your faith, me, Christian, I'm not mind all that God stuff. When actually you are, you're supposed to be. I'm afraid your own light will go out. So actually, 
the work or the need to witness, to tell people that, look here, I am a believer. Actually, if you don't do that, and if you hide your light under a bucket, then your own light will go out. We are designed by God in the bigger picture to be open about our faith. Now, by that, I do not mean being uh, pious and all this kind of stuff in a religious sense. I suppose I mean just talking to folks and being open to folks about, look here, I think this. I have this relationship with Jesus. Now, I said that it should be translated, really, neither do men light the candlestick and put it under a bucket. He's referring to how the priests used to go into the Jewish temple, tabernacles it was, and light the candlestick in the holy place. But that was only for the, uh, for the priests to do that. And Jesus is saying, but that's you. You are the priests. You are in the holy place. You are the candlestick that is giving light in the holy place. So again he's saying that you are special, you have got significance. That it is, if you like, spirituality and not, not religion. Likewise, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So let your light shine. So that men see your good works. Now let's just read it slowly and carefully. Let your light shine so that men may see your good works. And glorify God. The good works and the light are different. It doesn't mean, oh, just be a very nice person and very generous and everybody will see you're a Christian. That doesn't follow. That doesn't follow. When the Syrian war started, I was with a couple of other Christians in our Kerlix group, and we went to the border with Macedonia uh, to meet all the trains that were pouring through Europe with these refugees from Syria. And these people had been on the trains for like 40 hours and were hungry, needed to drink something, and they had proper clothes in European winter. And we stood there giving them our bit of aid. Oh, thank you, thank you. Up there, there was a just just a, well, 20 metres away, there was a bunch of Muslims, and they were giving aid, and better aid than what we were giving, and then up beyond them there was a group of atheists, as far as I know, and they were also giving loads of help. I don't think that just because you do good works to somebody, therefore they say, oh, praise God. Not necessarily. He says, let your light shine, so that people see your good works. I think what he means is, now, the light is God's word. Your word is a light to my path. I think what he's saying is, if you show clearly the light of Jesus to people, then people will understand you. Then people will look at the good works that you definitely should be doing, feeding the hungry and so on and so forth. And then they will glorify God. Just being a do-gooder alone Let your light shine, and then people will understand you, and understand themselves. So, summing all this up, we cannot be the secret Christians. We cannot hide our light. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. We were set up by God to have meetings with people whom we can influence, whom we can bring to see, to have vision, to actually understand life. We can give people sight. And it is that significance and meaning to the human person, which is what is made possible by Jesus, by conversion to him. So all this struggle for me, 
man's search for me, I suggest is only ultimately met by the fact that we are in Christ and that we are actually making some witness to some of us. And I know we're all shy. I'm shy. You're shy. We all are. And that's why I always pray every day, and I prayed with you this morning, give me meetings, please, Lord, with people who I can help to you. Those meetings might be online. Those, people, those meetings might be face-to-face. -face. Those people, those meetings might be face-to-face -face in person. They might be online. But give me meetings. And don't think, well, oh, I'm myself, I'm shy. Everybody's shy when it comes to preaching the gospel. I'm shy, you know, you are, we all are, every one of us. We need his help. But this is the ultimate meaning that you have. You can. That if you can bring somebody from darkness to light, if you can bring somebody from death to everlasting life, it's the most amazing, the most wonderful thing. So, this comes to its peak, really, in the Lord Jesus. And we're going to take the, the cups and the bread in memory of Jesus. Okay? Of his death and his resurrection. And there's a prophecy in the Old Testament about his death that says in Isaiah 53, he will look on the suffering of his soul and be satisfied. He will look on the suffering of his soul and be satisfied. In other words, all that he suffered on the cross, all that he suffered in his life, he will look back on it and be satisfied. And uh, he is real, right? Jesus is real. He is actually there in heaven and he is looking down on us here and he is satisfied. He sees a bunch of folks in South London sitting here in a pub, loving him in our weakness, yeah, wanting him, wanting to be like him, wanting to love him, wanting to accept his love, wanting to say yes to him, and he is satisfied and he remembers the trauma of his life and above all the eight hours on which he was crucified on the, uh, on the cross, and he looks at us and he is satisfied. And so, you can touch the heart of Jesus. You can touch the heart of God. This, this is an incredible idea. That I, as an apparently obscure, apparently insignificant little person down here, I can touch the heart of God, can touch the heart of Jesus. It, it seems impossible that he who is so far above me, physically, morally, spiritually, that I can touch his heart, that he can have feelings for me as a result of my prayer, as a result of my belief, as a result of my feelings toward him. But that is how it is. And that's the wonder of it all. And so it's quite right that we remember his death and his Resurrection. Now the bread represents his body and the cup represents his blood. And this is you know, the most wonderful thing that the Son of God, as Paul says, loved me and gave himself for me. That it's personal. And it might say, well, yes, but he loved her over there and gave himself for her. And he loved him over there and gave himself for him. And he loved me and gave himself for me. Well, I accept that that is a bit of a mystery. But all the same, it is true and can be felt that he, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. I know he did it for you and you and them over there, but he did it for me. And you can really feel that. You can really feel that. It is hard to find any, any sort of human analogy for it. I have spoken to women in Africa who are in polygamous marriages. And I've asked them 
because that verse is always stuck in my mind. The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. And I said to them, you know, how does it feel? I mean, I'm just a little bloke from the same moment. I'm not a, a woman in a, in a uh, polygamous marriage. So, you know, how does it feel? And I generally say, oh, yeah, it's great, yeah, it's fine. Um, uh, so I, he, he, I don't doubt that he loves me. I don't have a problem that he loves someone else. I have no problem with that. Well, that's a very true, not true, you know what I mean. It's, it's, it's a simple analogy. I don't know if there's women that just say that to me as the curious European bloke who asks the curious question, curious sort of person. I don't know if they're just answering me nicely. Maybe they is that I, I, I wouldn't know. Um, <laughs> but that's the closest analogy I can get to it. To try to explain that this mystery, that the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me, and he's got this special number on me, he's got a special number on you, a special number on you. Yeah, I know that. That doesn't worry me. He's got a special number on you and on you. But he died for me. And I feel that. And uh, it's a mystery that he died for me, but he also died for you. Okay, fine. I don't have a problem with that. Um, maybe those women would tell me the truth when they said, I don't have a problem with it. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe so. Because um, I don't have a problem with the fact that Jesus loved me, and he loved me as well. I see the wonder. I see the wonder of it all. That's what I want you to share. The wonder of it all. That he loves me. That I am not alone in this world. That I am not just a random person struggling with a few 50-50 half-baked relationships in my life and not quite sure where I stand with people, the relationships that I have. Oh, that's how it is. But I've got somebody. Someone who's not got feet of play. Someone who is not going to disappoint me. Someone who is not going to change. Because he doesn't change in that sense. The problem with all human relationships is you, you go into a relationship, not necessarily a romantic one, but you, you go into a relationship, be it romantic, be it not, with somebody as they are at this point. But the thing is, they change and you change. Where are you both going to be after five years? Who knows? Maybe you're both Christians, but after five years, he or she might be a Muslim. <coughs> well, that's not the basis we started on. And that's how it is. That's why all human relationships, apart from Cindy and I, Cindy and my relationship, um, all human relationships seem a little bit risky and a bit doomed to uncertainty. But the relationship with Jesus, there is no risk. There is no our oh, body my church. Who is it? There is no ah, oh, but he might just be showing me one face. He might be a nutter. <laughs> <laughs> Was that your experience of relationships, Carol? But <laughs> what I'm saying, just give me the way. But what I'm saying is, well, that's how it is, isn't it? I mean, you meet somebody, you think, oh, it's top bloke. And you can know him for years, and they say they show another face, and you think, oh, man, I thought I knew you. And I'm afraid that's life. Like, we don't live under the rock, right? That's how it is. But with Jesus, this is the one who will not disappoint. <coughs> This is the one who will not show another face and, oh, just kidding, I'm a psycho. No, 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 he, it's not going to be like that. There's going to be none of that. And he is going to be there for you even after you are dead and gone. The other great relationship thing, oh, which one of us is going to die first? Going to come to an end? Yeah, but this is the one that's not going to come to an end. You see, Jesus is real. He is there. Where two or three gather together in my name, he said, Then am I in the midst of them. He is here. He is here. But he is there as well. He is for me. If anyone here is still thinking about being baptized into Jesus, I would like to recommit this. You're a beautiful dungeon when I was baptized. It's lovely. Baptized. Well, well, Becky. Yeah. Right, this is the word. Well, well. Yeah, well, well. Yeah. Talk to me, yeah. talk to Cindy, and go for it. Be baptised, just into Jesus, not in any church in there, blah, blah, just into Jesus. Do it down at our place in South Croydon in the garden, go down the beach, where you want. It's got to be Liverpool, never walk alone. Liverpool? 
Yeah, I'm a Liverpool supporter, yeah. I'm going to be baptised. If you wanted to be baptised, if you wanted to be baptised in Liverpool, 200 miles from here, I will put you in my car and drive you there. That's a fact. That's a deal. That's a deal. Wow. Yeah. I would. I would. I So, let me read from 1 Corinthians 11, which is about the breaking uh, the bread. Paul says, I received of the Lord Jesus what I told you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. When he gave him thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So, why don't we come? Before you hand the bread down, huh? Before you hand the bread down, huh? just have a pray, right? Let's just have a prayer for the bread. Right. <clears throat> Let's all be super quiet. And uh, it's great to have Cindy's mum and dad here. Maybe Steve, could you give us a prayer for the bread? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together now. And we pray that you'll be with us and help us to remember the amazing sacrifice you've made for us. And this bread represents your body given for us. Please be with us, Father, and we thank you for the wonderful hope of salvation through Jesus. Amen. Amen. So this bread represents the body of Jesus that was given for us. I wonder, Kevin, could you pass the, pass the bread around? Right, let's give thanks for the cup that represents the blood of Jesus. Um, well, Robin, would you like to come to the bar and give, give a prayer for the cup? This is the symbol of his blood. The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. This is the symbol of his blood. Well, we're going to give thanks for the food, which is um, our hope coming. I hope you've got the right number of chicken and the right number of beef. Maybe we don't fight with each other if I got it wrong. But there should be enough enough food, don't worry. Let's just give thanks to that one. Kevin, could you give us a, a prayer for the, uh, for the bread? For the, for the food, sorry. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we want to thank you, Lord, for the food that you prepared for us. I pray you bless the food and bless each and every one of you. Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Anybody want to um, make any, any testimony? Anyone got any thoughts they'd like to share?